Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Um, we're, we've, got, uh, uh, we've got 20 minutes and one of the more difficult things to solve here, which is how is digitalization of finance transforming economies? We can figure that out in 20 minutes, um, surely. But we're going to start with you, Ishmael, because, um, well, more specifically, we're going to start with your homeland. You're from Somaliland, uh, one of uh, the, had been one of the most impoverished places in East Africa. Um, but it's been very quick to adopt digital money, digitalization of finance, in ways that are having a vis visible impact on the economy. Why don't you just give us a kind of quick case study in how this is affecting and, and transforming the economy in Somaliland? In 2009, when the successful mobile money service was uh, launched, Somaliland's GDP was 100% cash. Today, Somaliland is closer to a cashless economy than anywhere else in the world. And in a matter of uh, less than 10 years, the economy has been uh, transformed from a, you know, largely cash to a cashless, uh, thanks to the, the successful mobile money service. Um, I actually come back recently from Somaliland, and for about three weeks, I locked my wallet. Uh, I left in the, in, in the hotel for the first time I actually experimented. And all, all I had was uh, this, I traveled across the country and so for about three weeks, I did not touch cash. And you can actually find in Somalia people who have not touched cash for months because it's, uh, the mobile money service is uh, free locally, free for the businesses, free for individuals, uh, and, and therefore nobody likes to touch cash. Actually, the uh, small business discourage uh, cash because with mobile money, they can actually, at the end of the day, uh, buy goods and services from uh, wholesalers, other shops, and so on. So they don't have to go to anywhere to... to so to, to so what has that done for the economy, though? Does that, is that reduced corruption? Has it, has it helped, uh, you know, small businesses? What has it actually visibly done? So, so let's start with the individuals. Uh, the huge benefit, many of these were saving cash literally under the mattress before. And actually, so well, the economy is largely dollarized. Uh, so, but when somebody try, you know, converts an equivalent of $100 to local currency because of inflation, you needed like a wheelbarrow to move uh, $100 equivalent of money. So for individuals, it's a huge benefit. Uh, so so my the economy is largely dependent on uh, remittances, so, uh, so which accounts for as much as 40% of the GDP. So those uh, recipients of remittances who were in the past traveling to, big, uh, to the big cities to collect cash, can now get their money on the mobile uh, account. When we launched our service, so when that was actually our first corridor, and 100% uh, of our transactions were cash. We, we stopped cash now, because nobody wants cash. Is this the genesis for World Remit? Yes, 2010. So nobody wants cash now, so our transactions are 100% digital from send to receive. And what we have seen is that now recipients are saving the $10, $15 transportation cost that they used to spend to travel. Uh, and often it, were, it was often men who were collecting money and sometimes taking a cut. But uh, household budgets are managed by women. So what we have seen is that our recipients are now predominantly uh, women. In Somalia, I just recently looked at as much as 60% of our recipients are now women, whereas in the past, as much as 78% were men, because uh, men have probably less to do and they can uh, afford to waste time. <laughs> queuing up and, so, uh, and, and so really empowering uh, women. And, and sometimes, you know, uh, the men don't need to know even the, you know, the household head, often the women, has received money. Uh, so, 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 so. Uh, and for individual businesses, it means also, uh, compared to those who accept cards, they can they get their money instantly. They don't have to worry about disputes and delayed transactions where the bank sits your money for a couple of days and so on. So helping really cash, uh, uh, helping uh, with the cash flow. And, uh, and, 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 and so, and, and, I, and of course, and for the economy, what we're seeing is that a shift from informal to formal where it is possible for the first time to measure the economic activities which were outside the formal sector. And some African economies are now revising their GDP upwards because they're now for the first time measuring activities which were not a historical part of the uh, GDP. And, and lastly, and I think but the least, that is really helping improve security because uh, digital transactions means uh, 
uh, there is an audit trail. So when a transaction becomes suspicious, law enforcement agencies have something to look at. And, and often telcos know their customers better than banks because telcos not only have your transactions, uh, but they also know uh, who you are connected that to. Was, that was free <laughs> advertising for you. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, uh, I mean, I, I have an account uh, with, uh, you know, I live in London, but actually I have an account with this one, with the local money, mobile money service. And I think the KYC I, did, I went through this was far superior to what I've gone through uh, 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 with, with my bank. And I, there's a guarantor if something goes wrong with this uh, now uh, back home. So, so, so I think they've done quite a great job. Okay, in terms we'll of talk the, about the beneficiaries of, besides the people of Somaliland, land, but yeah. the companies in a second. Charlotte, I mean, you uh, were, you're now running Visa here in Europe, but, but you, before that, you were a central banker. You were, so you must have been looking at, at the issue of, well, financial technology and, and some of the things that Ishmael is talking about uh, and the impact on the British economy. And I'm, I'm curious if, if what we're seeing in Somaliland is sort of similar, what, what are, what, what's happening in developed economies where banking is, you know, already part of the system, and certainly we're almost, you know, more than half uh, non-cash. I mean, is it is there a similar sort of transformation taking place? So I think the question of whether digitalization and digital payments can actually grow economies is a really important one. And there's, from our perspective, there's at least four different ways that can happen. Um, at its most basic, it's things like transport. Um, you can make cities work more effectively if you can travel through them more effectively, if you know where people are. I think we see about two million transactions on the London metro every day, and that helps the metro figure out through where you Through the Oyster need. card or whatever? Actually, or, through their yeah. Visa card, mostly. Right. Um, but, but enabling cities to work more effectively as you see more urbanization, which we're going to see over the next few years, that's, that's a powerful lever. If anyone from the Paris metro is listening... I hope they are. Um, I think the second, the second element is around small business. And so the great fear of digitization is exclusion. Um, and, and that there are these major digital players that, that will, will, will do damage to local communities, local main streets, local villages. And so thinking about how you use the promise of digitalization, which should enable you to get beyond the prison of place, to allow small businesses to thrive in their local communities, employing local people. And for that, frankly, they need digital payments. Um, so I think there's a really important message for small businesses in enabling digital payments. I think the third element is, is around the shadow economy, and you've mentioned it, and frankly, that's still an issue in, in a number of countries in Europe. Um, and you see countries like Poland that have made huge strides over the last few years to, to bring cash transactions into into visibility. And then the last one I've been talking about with a couple of colleagues earlier is um, actually the third sector and charitable giving. So we're still quite, a lot of charities are quite dependent on the donation side on cash and increasingly you find that people give electronically, they give more, but also on the disbursement side, being able, as Ismail said, to, to give to the right people in the right places, not in kind, but in money. So there's four, I think, very important ways that you can see economies benefiting from Digitalization, and particularly digitalization of payments. Of course, one of the things that, and I, you know, I talk to people like, you know, fintech people like here, um, they love the idea of being able to disrupt or disintermediate the big banks. And the big banks, of course, have lots of brick and mortar. They got lots of people who are working in those in those branches. Um, you know, I look, I talk to my, you know, kids, twenty-year-old kids, and they're just like, what, what's a bank branch? Um, but there's a lot of people in those bank branches. How do, how do, how do regulators look at that with, from, with the point of view, not just of sort of financial stability, but you know, the economy? Is that a sort of a concern? So I think that what we're, what we're seeing in FinTech and, and in the banking system is, particularly in Europe, this, this very exciting juxtaposition of a monstrous change in regulation with open banking. Um, a real thriving technological sector. I mean, Europe is, is seeing many of the new fintech unicorns. But most importantly, this change in consumer behavior. And, you know, f for, for banks and for fintech, who in the end are trying to enable a better s consumer experience, providing along the dimensions of things that really matter to consumers will, will enable banks and fintech to thrive. And the things that I think matter are people feeling in control of their financial life, knowing where they're spending their money and, and how to manage it. And you can see how important that is with the US shutdown recently, how many 
people were really struggling over the last three weeks to couldn't, couldn't they to just manage get them. a loan? Well, and the banks. Joke. And by the way, the banks did did really react on that. I know. Um, I know. But managing your life very important. Right. Feeling secure, knowing what happens when you pay, and particularly when your fridge is buying milk, knowing that's going to be okay. And making it simple. You know, this, there's a lot of complexity in life. Making it simple for people is important. And I see banks doing that, and fintech, and both of them working together. So that's a healthy ecosystem, I right, think. Right, right, right. Paul, why would I, why would I, if I, why would I trust um, a, a telephone company with my money? Well, I, I think the first question is, why should you go to a bank to open a, to open a banking account? Because I know there's the, the, they're overseas. There's deposit protection. There's regulation. There's supervisors. There's all of that would be the, 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 the reason I would go to a bank. OK, but you know many person waking in the morning and just thinking, well, I need to go to a bank today because I like going to a bank. Nobody likes his bank. In, in fact, we did, we did a survey in, uh, in, in, in Europe uh, last week, which we published last week, and we asked people, do you know your banker? 50% tell us, I don't even know my banker. I don't even know the name of, our, of my banker. Would you like not to go anymore to your banker? 50% say yes. <laughs> and then we ask, do you think that your bank advice is made in the interest of your bank or for yourself? 90% of the European citizens believe that the, the advice given by the bank is only in the interest of the bank. I, I, I may think the remaining 10% may be bank employees. It's the only reason why they say to answer so. Um, so that's the question. Why, why, do you, why you, don't go, you don't need any more to go to a bank? Then the question is, why would you go to a telco? Uh, I think for two reasons. first one is that we are much better than banks to control and to, to, to develop a UX, which is adapted to the new behavior of our customers. Because we, we know how to, to behave like with a mobile phone. That's the first reason. The second reason is the data. We know the customers. We know, uh, based on the telco data, we, we can predict your credit risk. That means if someone asks us to grant him or her a loan, based on the telco data, we can say yes or no. And that's something which no many new entrants can provide to the customer. But, but that also could be a little scary, right? So some people might think of that as a, wait a second, what, you're watching where I am, how I'm, you know, what, or, or is this just a simple, they pay their bills every month? No, in, in fact, um, what we do, if someone asks us for a loan, first we will ask him or her, are you ready for, are you ready to share your telco data with us? Not, obviously, not who are you calling, but how often are you calling, and, and so on. And based on that, I can predict your, your credit risk. But your question is a very interesting one. In fact, in this survey, we asked people, OK, you don't like your bank anymore. So would you like to buy banking product to a retailer, to a telco, or to a GAFA? In fact, in Europe, a retailer and telco are very high. GAFA were much below. GAFA is Google, what you said. Alphabet, Facebook. Exactly. Okay. Based on what you say, because people feel that GAFA may handle their data, especially uh, regarding banking, in a way they don't like it. Interesting. Okay, but so let's talk about the account. How does it, have, what is, how is it transformed? I mean, you, you're obviously very large in France, but also you're, you're across Africa. I mean, maybe, so there's probably two different points, but you know, how do you see it actually transforming sort of the economic life? In well, in Africa, the answer is very simple, and I feel with what you said. Uh, in Africa, in many countries, you have only 10 to 20 percent of the population which has a, who has a bank. And so we bring to the remaining 80 percent a way to transfer money uh, in the country or abroad. And we also provide them a way to, uh, to take a loan at a reasonable price. Because otherwise, these, these people, they would go uh, to uh, an informal way of doing lending with an interest rate of more than 10 percent a month. So by far, we're, we're transforming the economy, and the discussion we often have with the central bank in these African countries, they believe that if we do our job properly, which is always a challenge in banking, uh, we can obviously develop financial inclusion, inclusion uh, very rapidly. That's for, uh, that's for Africa. For Europe, well, obviously, everybody has a bank. Um, but in Europe, we can contribute to so sort of commoditization of uh, of the, bank, of the banking uh, product, of the banking relationship. Uh, banking is never an objective in itself. Uh, you, you don't want to do, uh, to do a loan because you want to do a loan. You want to do a loan because uh, you want to finance something. You don't want to invest because you want to invest. You want to invest because you want to create wealth for a project. So I think with the telco, uh, we make banking uh, something which is 
uh, an enabler for a, a larger project rather than a, a project in itself. Of course, you know, so you, I understand you have the relationship with the customers and a certain amount of trust in, in who you are. Um, you, uh, you have the ability to do all this, the data. Why, but you've got, you, people sell phones, don't know how to sell financial services, do they? Don't have an interest, sorry. Well, they don't, I mean, a, a sales phone guy isn't really a banker. No, that's a good point. Uh, in fact, since I joined uh, Orange uh, one year ago, I've been visiting many, many uh, Orange shops and always asking to see the sellers. Usually people introduce me to the good sellers, never to the bad sellers, so I always ask to see also the bad sellers. And what the good sellers tell me is that I'm not a banker, I'll just help the customer to, uh, to, to download a banking application and then to use this banking app. I won't do the banking job. And in fact, the, and these good sellers, they do more than 40 opening a month, which is huge. A banker would do no more than four or five new opening a month, so it's so excellent. As opposed to the bad sellers who tell me, look, I, I'm not a very good seller because I'm not a banker. That's good news, we'll never be a banker. I don't ask you to, to, to be a banker because this job of banker will disappear. You're just there to introduce people to the, to, to the new uh, banking, to, to the new digital banking relationship. We, we, we don't, the banker, in fact, is a customer now. Banker is uh, mature enough to be his own banker. Last night, Apple had its results, and one of the things it decided to do was break out more information regarding the profitability of services. Why aren't they going to eat every telco's lunch? Um, well, it's... Um I, I haven't seen this, this information from Apple. It's very interesting. Well, just think the, 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 the handset provider, well, in this case, Apple, which see, people seem to trust quite a bit. Tim Cook has made a, a real point of saying, we're not going to take your data. Right. Right. In fact, we, we, we share the Apple, with Apple the, the principles that we don't want the shared, the shared data, that we want to be extremely, um, to have a very high requirement in terms of uh, what do we do with, with, the, with the data. So far, Apple is more positioned on the, on the payment side. And uh, what's very interesting in the relationship we have with, with Apple is that we'll be launching in uh, France, in Spain, in several Euro European countries, we'll be launching the financing of handset. Uh, because uh, mobile handsets are more and more expensive. In fact, I think the main difference between a new handset and the previous one is the price. But it's more and more expensive. So people need to finance that. And that's why uh, we're quite close with Apple because uh, they feel that we need to provide easy solution to finance handsets. And you just do it through your own bank, so you don't yes. have to go through some thir ex third party provider. Exactly. exactly. And that based on the sense. telco behavior of the client, we know if we can finance him or her to buy a new handset. Where does Visa fit into this? I always find, like, you know, I sort of think of you as this sort of the firmament, you know, this sort of thing that's everywhere. It's behind everybody's business. But I mean, how do you position yourselves in this, in this whole disruptive but exciting space? I think there's really interesting elements that are happening. Um, one is, of course, we're, we're truly global, and I do, I do find that an immense privilege um, and responsibility. We're also the seventh most recognized consumer brand in the world, which is interesting for a company that has no relationships with con direct relationships with yeah, consumers that's through our partners. But I think on aspects of, with that brand, um, giving people confidence that wherever they go in the world, they can pay and they can pay securely, and increasingly securely with things like tokenization, which is what sits underneath Apple Pay to make it particularly secure. Um, that they know it's simple and they know how it works, and they know what happens if a payment goes wrong. So if you buy something and it doesn't work or you don't know how to fix it, you know, there's a whole set of 60 year old rules that figure out how to send that back. So that promise I think is very important in a world that is being very disrupted. Yeah. Um, and, you know, we invest, continue to invest in all of that in, 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 in security, incredibly important aspects as the world changes. And, and also enabling our clients to give a better consumer experience. So I talked about helping people feel in control of their financial life. <coughs> We're providing the APIs that allow you to do things like say, I'm going to this particular country, I'm going to turn my card on for that but turn it off when I come back. Or I don't want my daughter to spend more than, I've got a teenage daughter, uh, spend more than a 50 pounds a week in this particular store. So enabling that control off our APIs, I think is an increasingly important thing that you'll see. Right. 
Can I can, go ahead, Ishmael? I, I think let me come to this point. I think which is connected to why you know customers are trusting uh, telcos, and and they, I think the relationship or between the card schemes or the way card schemes are set up on the bank is, I think, is a relic of the past, and I think. Particularly the way banks manage that relationship is, is stifling innovation. Uh, I remember one of the biggest challenges we had when we launched was the, uh, the deferred kind of settlement schemes that banks impose on you when you're a small business and say that you cannot get your money five days sometimes. In our case, actually, at some point we had a, what we call, I think, two weeks of deferred settlement, which means we were offering customers, uh, you know, to receive the money quickly, but the card money was uh, arriving sometimes 14 days later. Compare that to what's happening in the, uh, uh, particularly in Africa, where telcos have launched these successful mobile money services, uh, which are actually fostering innovation. Because in the early days when you were a small business, what matters is the cash flow. What matters is that you can get your money instantly. There is no dispute and so on. Why should a small business in Paris or London which accepted money cannot get that money on their account instantly. You know, we have the technology. Uh, why should they pay up to 3% of the charge? Why should there be a dispute? All those uh, telco transactions are all guaranteed, like, just like cash. So I think uh, if there's something we need to learn from uh, the uh, African economies now that are leapfrogging, it is really the issue of revisiting that whole kind of a, old arrangement. Can you, can you allow me to yeah, just respond a little bit to that, if you don't mind? At the heart of the schemes, and as a you know, former economist at least, mm. we are an open network. And that promises to the world two very important externalities, one of which is wholly related to innovation. Mm. The first thing about an open network, if you do it right, is that the value increases the more the people who join. So being open is fundamentally at the core of who we are. The second thing that happens is that if you can provide a set of standards and um, in our case, increasingly APIs, then people innovate off the back of that. So actually, open networks do create very strong positive indirect externalities, and we see that all the time. Should we continue to innovate on some of the topics you've just mentioned, like speed? Yes, and we are. Um, but at the heart of who we are is an open network, and at the heart of that is the standards that allow people to innovate on top. And an API means you're sharing data. We are sharing data um, that allow people to do things that they choose to do, like turn their card off or turn it on. How, how does that fit into what you're doing? I mean, you, have, you mentioned data as being sort of a, a, key, a, a key differentiator for, for Orange. Well, for, first, I fully agree with what you say. I mean, we, for example, as, uh, as Orange, we cannot innovate on many things because we, we try to innovate as a maximum, but relying on partners like you who provide us with some innovation, with some API, it makes a lot of sense. Uh, nobody can uh, find himself or herself all the innovation needs to be. So we need to rely on, uh, on fintechs, on people like you to bring some innovation to us, and then we bring this innovation to, to, the, to the market. That's, that's for sure. That's the same on the, on, the, on the data, on the data issue, how to, to use as a maximum this data to better do our job. That we can do on ourselves. We also need to work, to work with partners who will perhaps gather some external data. So on all these issues, we cannot work, work alone. Perhaps a little bit different in Africa, where the only structured data you have on 80% of the population is a telco one. In Europe, that's very different. In Europe, there are so many data, so it's, it's more complex. But in Africa, we are the owner of the only structured data which exists on a very large part of the population. So it's a, that we can manage perhaps more alone. How many countries to, are you in, in? 17 countries. 17? Yeah, 17. Okay. In, in Africa. All francophone or just across? Mostly francophone. Right. Not all, but mostly francophone. I got a question for you, Ishmael. So if I think about your business, and I think a little bit what Paul said here, that you know 20% maybe maximum in, in Africa is bank. What happens when they're all banks? Do they need to, does your business become less relevant? Or, I mean, or is this, or, or do you have a sort of special niche that will last well beyond, um, you know, the banking uh, or the sort of financialization of the African continent? Well, uh, Don't forget that, Mike. Yeah. Yes, you know, good, yes, sir. Uh, uh, partners are telcos primarily in Africa, so we work with you know uh, the likes of Orange, uh, 
you know, MTN, Vodafone, and, and so on. And whereas, you know, only when we started five, six, seven years ago, uh, our partners were only uh, retail networks and banks. So, so that is changing. And, and I think what, what, what is really quite exciting, and so that's what we provide. So we're now leading the uh, provider of mobile to mobile uh, transactions. In Africa already, more than half of our transactions go to mobile money accounts. And often when we talk about mobile money, I mean, we're just talking about, for those who don't know, it's a, you know, somebody with a basic feature phone where the mobile uh, number becomes an account number. And, and in Africa, actually, this is still you know, quite popular. Uh, so this was uh, the uh, mobile phone I had in um, 2005 when Impressor was launched. Did you get that from a museum? Where did that come? Is that from no, a museum? No, this was actually the phone I had. I used to work for the UN, so I was in Nairobi when right. Impressor was launched there. Yeah. So I actually set up the, one of the first Impressor uh, uh, accounts, uh, which was really inspired what we see in, in Africa on, on this. On this. Uh, and when I go back, I'm actually quite surprised that this is still quite popular because uh, the battery lasts is, you know, for days. And I've actually seen, uh, you know, pastoralists, nomadic pastoralists who cross the border between Somalia and Ethiopia, who have this one, and they only turn on, uh, on when they are close to a village, talk to somebody, uh, receive money, and then uh, do their shopping with this one. So it's just incredibly powerful. And, and, and in fact, worth adding also, two years ago, there was a major famine in East Africa. And for the first time, technology played a key role in averting that famine turn into, uh, that, that drove into, uh, into famine because the technology, this technology and the instant communication, you know, WhatsApps and so on, helped revive the traditional African wealth sharing mechanisms where somebody in Paris could share even a small amount, skip a lot of money we talk about, somebody skip a lot and then share that money with somebody who is probably at the border with Ethiopia. So they can buy water and right. so on. So, so it's hugely impactful in terms of what they, they, they do. Okay, let me ask, so we've got a couple more minutes, but what about China? So uh, I'll give you an example, like, not like you, but my, well, yes, like you, my son was pickpocketed in Beijing this week. And uh, so I had to work with him to try to get, figure out money. Luckily, it's all, like, he, he'd lost his visa, everything was gone, and a bunch of other cards, but it, his WeChat pay allows him to do pretty much everything in ways that, oh, no, you know, my banking, the US or U European bank um, does not allow me to do. Are you guys, are we, wh what's your sense of the, the, you know, when it's Alipay or WeChat Pay? How, it, it seems to me that they are way out ahead of everybody, partly probably because they're not regulated quite the same way, or maybe I'm wrong. What do you think? Quick round on China. So in terms of a customer experience, you know, they're, they're great, but the elements of it are mobile, ability to be able to work seamlessly between ordering, you know, booking a restaurant, ordering your food and paying it at the same time. That essence is, is incredibly valuable. It doesn't have to be done in that way and it doesn't have to be done in a closed loop network. And you're right to say they're not regulated in the same way. And one of the, the strengths of the European system is that when something walks like a duck, and speaks like a duck and quacks like a duck. It's a duck. It's a duck. <laughs> um, and the regulators sort of say, aha, that's a bank. Right. And I think that more philosophical approach to thinking about financial stability is important. And you can see them catching up in China now. But in terms of, of thinking about what is it that consumers want and how to take, in our case, take an open network and make it more open, working with more fintechs and more people who provide a great consumer experience, of course we should look to that. Yeah. No, fully full agree with what you have to say. On one hand, uh, user experience is fantastic. The, the wealth is, is and creativity is fantastic. On the other hand, they operate in a country where neither the data protection regulation, neither the banking regulation is the same. But it should be, shouldn't be an excuse for us to consider them as too far, because the point. regulation can always adapt. So we need to, to have that in mind, but uh, less, yes, the background is so different. I mean, aren't they taking over Ch uh, Africa, the Chinese? That's the sort of conventional wisdom. <laughs> yes. The, oh, I think the digitization in Africa is also helping uh, Africans to trade, particularly with China. Yeah, so, uh, I mean, we send money to about 47 countries in Africa, and almost all of them, China is their you know, uh, primary uh, kind of main, main trading partner. So, of course, with digitization in China and Africa means that uh, 
doing trade would become easier. So there would be less cash in terms of businesses trying to import goods from uh, China. And yeah, for the first time we're seeing both in China and in Africa businesses that prefer digital transactions. You know? So China, some businesses will say that they don't accept cash. Kind of so. Where, uh, and, and, and that's the advantage of the, uh, the, the, these new uh, mobile money uh, technologies. Last question for you, Ismail, just because I gave you the first one, I'll give you the last one. But um, you're, the, you, you two guys are big companies, Visa, Orange, you're a, a startup. What's your plan? What, what, in five years, will you be part of one of these fine companies, or will you be um, buying one of them? Uh, probably buy it. Uh, no, we, we, we might not need to buy it. <laughs> the, I think we're, what we see now is really the power of uh, network partnerships, you know. So the partnerships we're building with a lot of uh, different players uh, because we now, we, we, we send money to about to more than 140 countries and we're licensed or kind of send money from, you know, all the 50 US states uh, and we send returns from about uh, 50 countries. And I think we're, we're, uh, we're still growing, you know, and helping a lot of customers move from traditional cash-based remittance to digital. And we can't do that on our own, obviously. So we have uh, across the world, you know, in Africa, Asia, Latin America, and also in Europe, setting up partnerships uh, uh, that can help us uh, to reach more customers. Okay. Nice way to not answer my question. But that's good. <laughs> Thank you. Please uh, give my panel a fabulous uh, applause. Thank you, guys.